Hello everyone and welcome to another Blender Made Easy tutorial. Today we're going to be creating this cloth transition effect entirely in Blender. To get started with this tutorial, we need to decide which objects that we want to transform. Now you can use any object that you want, just make sure that the geometry on it is even throughout the entire thing. This will make the cloth simulation work a lot better. If you want to use the same object I'm using, I'll put the link in the description. This object was used with the rock generator add-on in Blender. You can add your own rock or you can use the one I'm using. So here is the object in Blender and the first thing that we're going to do is set up dynamic paint. This will allow us to control where the transition effect happens on our object. So to do this, we're going to jump over to the physics panel, select dynamic paint. We're going to leave the type on canvas and then select add canvas. And of course, since we're using dynamic paint, we also need a brush for our scene. So we're going to press shift A. We're going to add in a new object. Let's go with Icosphere. The bottom left corner right here, we're going to set the subdivisions up to a level of four. That looks pretty good. And then we'll just scale it down to be about the size of our object. From here, we're going to move it over to the right side. We're going to place it right here and then over 220 frames. It's going to encapsulate the entire thing. So on frame one, we're going to hit K and add in a location keyframe. Next, we're going to jump all the way to frame 220. We'll drag this all the way up till it encapsulate the entire thing. Then we'll press K again and add in another location keyframe. Now for the interpolation between these two keyframes, we're going to box select both of them in the timeline, hit T while hovering over the timeline and select linear. Over in the physics panel, we're going to select dynamic paint, switch the type over to brush, and then add in a new brush. Over in the source panel, here is how the brush is gonna paint on our object. Instead of using mesh volume, I want there to be a little bit of a smooth transition, so we're gonna go with mesh volume and proximity. The distance slider here controls how far away the proximity is from the brush to the canvas. And to see this in action, let's select our object, our canvas, we're gonna switch the surface type from paint over to weight, open up the output tab, and then check this box right here to add in a new vertex group. So now if we jump over to the object data panel, we can see that right here in the vertex groups. So now with the canvas selected, if we press control tab and go into weight paint mode, we can see this is a very smooth transition, but currently it's way too much. So what we'll do is we'll go back into object mode, select the brush and bring the distance down much lower. Let's go with a value of 0 0.05 and enter. And now we can see that's a much sharper transition, which is good. And that's basically all we need to do for our dynamic paint. So let's scroll down here in the canvas settings and bake this in. If you see that this is grayed out, that's because you need to save your project. So go ahead and save it and then you'll be able to bake this in. All right, the bake has finished and now we are ready to set up the cloth simulation. We're going to come up here, we're going to collapse the dynamic paint, and then let's hide the icosphere from the view and hide it from the render as well. We're not going to need it anymore. Now before we select the cloth in the physics panel, I want to do a couple of other things. First off, we're going to jump over to the object data panel. We're going to add in a new vertex group by hitting that plus sign. The purpose of this new group is to make sure the object does not move as the simulation plays. So with that new group selected, we'll press control tab, go into weight paint, and then just paint a little bit right on our object, just on the back here to make sure that it doesn't move. And this is gonna be the pin group for our object. That looks pretty good, just something like that. It doesn't need to be too big, just a little spot just like that. Back in object mode, we're gonna jump over to the modifier tab, and we're gonna combine both that group that we just created and our dynamic paint group. And to do that, we're gonna select add modifier, edit, and then add in a vertex weight mix modifier just like that. For the group A, we're gonna select DP underscore weight, which is the dynamic paint. And then for the group B, we're gonna do this one right here, the one that we just created. Instead of using group A and B, we're gonna switch it to group A or B. And then for the mix mode, we're going to add both of these groups together. So now what happens is if we come back over to the object data panel, we'll select this one to see what it looks like. We'll go into weight paint mode. We can see it's added the group right here to the DP underscore weight group. And now if we play the animation, we can see this effect and that's what we want. We want this to be right here until the weight encapsulates the entire object. 
There we go. So now with that set up, we are ready to work on the cloth simulation. Let's jump over to the physics panel and then select cloth. Make sure you restart the timeline to bring back our object. And the first thing that we'll do is set the vertex mass down here much lower. We'll go with a value of 0 0.08 just to make sure that the vertex weighs a lot less and it'll be able to flow a bit more. Next, we're gonna come down here and you might think that we want to enable pressure for this to work and that's actually not what we're gonna be using. I've noticed with pressure that it just doesn't look as good. It kind of creates a balloon effect, which if that's what you want, great. But for this simulation in particular, I want the cloth to be flowing a lot more. So instead of using pressure, we're gonna open up the shape tab and use the shrinking factor and the pin group right here. Now to give some context of how we're creating this effect is we're actually gonna be simulating this backwards and then reversing the frames after the render is done. The reason we're doing this is because I found it looks a lot better than having the simulation play normally. The cloth will move and flow around much better. So to do that, we're going to select the pin group and then select DP underscore weight. So what this is going to do, again, if we go into weight paint, so you can see right at the beginning, everything is blue. So that means that the entire thing will be flowing. And as the simulation plays, it's going to start to turn back into a rock with this pin group. And then at the end, frame 220, it'll be solid. And the other thing that we're going to change is the shrinking factor. Negative values will expand the cloth outwards and positive values will shrink it down. Since I want this to flow a lot more and be bigger, we're gonna go with a negative value of negative 0.3. Finally, we're gonna open up the collisions tab, set the self collision on, and then set the distance of the self collision much lower. Let's go with a value of 0 0.002. We're gonna open up the field weights as well, set gravity to zero, and then add in a, then add in a turbulence force field. So we're gonna press shift A, go over to force field, and then add in a turbulence force field. We'll set the strength of this up to 1500, the size 2.2, and then the flow will go with a value of 0.5 as well. With that done, we are ready to bake this in, so make sure you save your project, open up the cache. We don't really need 250 frames, so let's go with a value of 230, and then we'll click on bake. All right, the simulation has finished. Let's jump over to frame 230 and then play it backwards, and we can see what the final result will look like. The next step in this tutorial is to set up the textures and the transition in the material. To do this, we're gonna split this view by clicking and dragging out in the top left corner and switching it over to the shader editor, or you could go over to the shading workspace. With the canvas selected, we're gonna create a new material. From here, make sure you go over to your user preferences and then enable the Node Wrangler add-on. Underneath the add-ons, you can type in the word Node Wrangler and you should see it right there. Make sure that is enabled. And if you wanna use the same textures I'm using, I'll put both of them in the description. So with the principal shader selected, we're gonna press Control, Shift, and T to add in a new texture setup. The first one that we will be adding is the rock texture. So go ahead and open up that folder, go over to textures. We're going to add in the diffuse, normal, and roughness textures. Go ahead and add those in. And with the Node Wrangler add-on, it'll automatically add them in the correct positions. Next, to UV unwrap this object, all we really need to do is go into front view, go into edit mode, and then just project it from the view because we're not going to be able to see the backside and this is a pretty weird object to UV unwrap. So I'm just going to position right at the front view right about here, press U and then go project from view. If we go into the material preview now, we should be able to see our texture and you can see it's a little bit stretched right there, but you won't really be able to see that from the camera view. So I think that is okay. Over on the right side, we're gonna set the scale of this up to a value of, let's try three. And I think that looks pretty good. And you can play around with the UV map and normal map if you want to add in a little bit more bump. I think that might look pretty good. Drag it up just to around two or so. Then to add in the other textures, we're going to, we're gonna do that exact same thing. Select the principal shader, shift D it, we'll drag it down here. Press Control Shift and T while hovering over the principal shader. And this time we're gonna be adding in the fabric texture. Again, both of these textures are linked in the description. Select all of the textures and go add a principled setup. To see what this one looks like, we're gonna press Control Shift and left click on this node. And right now the texture is way too big. So let's click and drag over the scale and drag this up until we're happy with the result. So something like 
this might be pretty good. And then I'm also going to rotate this along the along the Z axis just a little bit. So it's kind of more at an angle like that. I think that'll look pretty good. And again, you can see these stretched textures, but I don't think you're going to be able to see that very well from the camera view. If you don't like the color of this texture, you can change it by adding in a color mixed color, placing it right here and switching the type over to the color mode. And now this bottom value should control how the texture looks. So if you want more of a blue color, you can drag this over to the blue and then the factor controls how strong of an effect that is. Now to combine both of these textures together, we're going to come over here. We're going to press shift a, add in a shader and then a mix shader, place it here. Take the rock texture, plug it into the bottom input, and then the principal shader for the fabric is gonna go into the top input. Then for the factor, we're gonna add in a new node, we're gonna add in an attribute node. And then for the name right here, we want to use the exact same name that is for the vertex group, the DP underscore weight. So what I like to do is just control C to copy that and then paste it right here, DP underscore weight, just like that. We'll take the factor and plug it into the factor of the mix shader and then plug it into the surface output. And now if we skip over to frame 220, you'll still see that nothing has changed. And the reason for that is because this setup, this attribute with the DP underscore weight only works in cycles. So we're gonna have to jump over to the render engine and switch it over to cycles. Now, if we go into the rendered preview, we should be able to see our textures. As you can see there, it is now working and now we have two different textures applied to our object. And now for the lighting, let's add in a sun lamp right here. We'll rotate the sun lamp till it's about this angle and rotate it along the Z so it's facing that direction. And now if we go into the preview, we'll be able to see what it looks like. Over in the sun lamp settings, we're gonna set the strength of this up to around five. And then in the render settings, we're gonna come down to the color management and set the look right here to very high contrast. Now the colors and textures should pop a lot more. You can play around with the rotation of the sun till you get something that you like. I think that looks pretty good. For the world settings, I'm gonna bring the color up just a little bit so it's slightly brighter, something like that. And I'm also going to open up the film section and turn on transparency. So the background does not show up in the final render. That looks pretty good. Let's press shift A. We're going to add in a new camera object, go into the front view and then press control alt numpad zero to snap the camera to view, or you can come up to view down to align view and then select it right there. Align active camera to view. We'll zoom this out and then place the camera where we want. Something like that will look pretty good. I also like to add a little bit of camera movement. And since we're playing this in reverse, we're going to jump to frame 230 and we might as well set this to frame 230 as well. The end frame, the start frame also, you can see right here, it kind of expands outwards. So we're going to skip the first like eight frames or so. So for the start, we're going to go up to a value of eight. So again, at frame 230, we're going to press K and then add in a location keyframe with the camera selected. And then at the beginning, we're going to zoom out a little bit and maybe up a little bit as well. Press K and then add in another location keyframe. With both of these keyframes selected, we're going to press T and switch it to linear. So the camera moves at a constant rate. And now we can see we get this cool effect as it's playing backwards. Let's go ahead and jump to frame 220 or so. We're going to set the max samples down to 30. We don't really need that many samples. And then from here, we're going to render out a single image and then set up the background. From here, we're going to exit out of that and jump over to the compositing workspace. Select use nodes, press N to close off that panel and just drag this down a little bit. And now we're going to set up the background image. We're going to press control shift and left click on the render layers. That's going to add in a viewer node so we can see what we're doing. And you can press V or alt V to zoom out the image. To add in a background, we need to go over to color, mix and then add in an alpha over node. Place that right here. This needs to go into the bottom input and this can go into the composite. Now this image right here, this color image can change to be whatever background that you want. I might just drag it down slightly so it's more of a gray color. And then the other thing I like to add to this render is a vignette so that the corners are darkened and the focus is on the middle. We can do this pretty easily by adding in a mask and then a ellipse mask right here. Let's preview this. 
We'll bring the width up to around one and then the height will also drag up. From here, we need to blur out those corners. So we're gonna add in another node. It's gonna be filter, blur, and then add in a normal blur node. Set the blur amount much higher until you're happy with how the blur looks. And then to combine this with our image, we're gonna add in a color mix, mix color. Take the blur, plug it into the bottom input and switch the type over to multiply. That's gonna get rid of the white values, but keep the dark values. And now we can see we have this effect. The factor, we're gonna go down to around 0.4, maybe 0.5, something like that will look pretty good. And now we have a nice vignette along the corners. So now we're ready to do a final render. Make sure you jump over to the output tab, set the resolution and dimensions that you want, and then make sure you have a folder of where all of your frames are gonna to go to. Once you've done that, save your project, and then go over to render and render animation. The render has finished, so now let's go ahead and reverse the frames. Back in Blender, we're gonna come up to this menu right here, hit the plus sign, go down to video editing, and then select the video editing workspace. Make sure your cursor is at the beginning of the animation, then go add down to image sequence, and then navigate to where your frames are. We can see my frames are right here. And what you wanna do is make sure that it's sorted by modified date rather than name. If it's switched to name, then you're gonna do the normal order. But if you go modified date, it'll put the last frame at the beginning. And then we can press A to select everything and go add image strip. And now if we play through the animation, you can see it's in the order that we want. And there we go. So now all we have to do is come over to the output tab, switch the file format over to a movie file. And in the encoding, I'm going to switch it over to MP4. The output quality, I'm gonna go with high. Then from there, you can go ahead and render this out. Go up to render and then click on render animation. And it's gonna put that movie file in the exact folder that the other frames are at. But there we go, that is how you create a cloth rock transition in Blender. Thank you very much for watching, and if you created something cool, please send it to me on Instagram at BlenderMadeEasy. I would love to see it. If you have other ideas for tutorials you would like to see in the future, let me know in the comments down below, and I will see you guys in the next one.